Uh, good morning. Uh, as, as was said, my name's Howard Feynman. I'm a political correspondent with Newsweek magazine, and I also report for NBC News and, and MSNBC uh, out of Washington. I'm based in Washington, but uh, the reason I'm here is that I'm a native Pittsburgher. And uh, I have lived both personally uh, and at a distance and journalistically through the transition, uh, the, the economic transition of Pittsburgh, excuse me, uh, which is the reason why you're here. Uh, the story of Pittsburgh is a story of renewal. And I'm a reporter and I'm a skeptic by nature. Uh, and since I don't actually live in the city, I can have some distance on it. And, and I can tell you as America looks to the 21st century and as it welcomes the uh, economic and political leaders of the world, um, Pittsburgh has a story that needs to be known uh, because it's a story of America's hope economically and politically for that matter in the 21st century. Uh, this was an industrial city. Uh, heavy industrial city. This was a city where when my uh, grandmother and mother uh, went shopping, when my grandmother, uh, when my mother was a, a girl, uh, used to take with them uh, on their shopping visits to downtown Pittsburgh, a change of uh, blouse and a washcloth with them because the uh, pollution in the air from the uh, open hearth steel mills uh, was so intensive that they couldn't get through the day and stay clean. Uh, that was the Pittsburgh of the 20s and 30s, uh, and that was a Pittsburgh that existed up until the 1980s. That city is gone. Uh, and what has replaced it through a lot of pain and turmoil uh, is a new city based on the economies of the future. Uh, those economies include entertainment and tourism, you may have heard of a football team called the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, they're a global commodity. It's based on financial services. Banks like PNC and we'll even count uh, Bank of New York Mellon. Uh, and green technologies. Ironically, the city of Pittsburgh was one of the first to begin to clean up its own air and water, uh, installing smoke control in the late 40s. Uh, and from that tiny base, uh, a great green technology has grown up. But the key right now to Pittsburgh's future, and in many ways to America's future, are two technologies and two sectors that are represented here. Uh, the shorthand for them is EDS and MEDS. And we have the leader, the leaders of the EDS and MEDS sectors here. They overlap, and the synergies between them are yet another reason why Pittsburgh is such a success story that Barack Obama wants to show to the world at a point where, frankly, America's economic leadership on the planet is not only called into question, but was, is more necessary than ever. Uh, so here are the people that I want to introduce to you. Uh, from my uh, immediate left, uh, Jared Cohen, who's the president of Carnegie Mellon University, one of the great uh, research universities uh, uh, in the world. Immediately next to him is Chancellor Mark Nordenberg, uh, the chancellor of the University of Pittsburgh also one of the great research universities in the world. And let me pause right here to say that there are very few places in America, if not the world, where two such great universities are literally right next door to each other. Uh, the only other one I can think of uh, is a city uh, near Boston called Cambridge, Massachusetts. You don't usually think of Pittsburgh and Cambridge, Massachusetts in the same mental breath. Get used to it. And taking advantage of and building on the great resources of the universities here, plus Pittsburgh's great tradition of medical care, uh, is uh, Jeffrey Romoff, who is the president and CEU, CEO, that is, of UPMC. UPMC has its roots in the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, but has become one of the largest uh, healthcare providers in the country, if not the world. Uh, these are great leaders and innovators, and I wanted to present them to you uh, this morning and ask them some questions. Uh, this is not meet the press, uh, but let me start 
uh, with with a with a tough one, if I could, uh, for President Cohen of CMU. Uh, you've had great success, um, but right now the United States might be limited somewhat in terms of research money, in terms of resources, to make sure that the successes that Pittsburgh has made can be maintained in the future. What is what is CMU doing to keep the lead that it's fought so hard to, to get? I thought Mark and Jeff were going to get the hard questions. <laughs> I was supposed to get the softballs. Uh, it's a great question, Howard. Before I answer it, though, let me welcome you home. Thank you. And welcome all of our visitors from around the world. This is a very, very exciting week for Pittsburgh and a well-deserved week of attention on Pittsburgh for all the reasons you said, Howard. It is a great story. And It'll be wonderful to have a chance to tell it. In Curtin and Mellon's case, um, it's interesting. First of all, we have to realize that Carnegie Mellon's history, in a lot of ways, mirrors the history of Pittsburgh. And when I say that, I mean we started as a trade school, basically, a century ago. That's what Andrew Carnegie had in mind. And we've evolved over those years, and especially over the last 30 or 40 years, 30 or 40 years into one of the leading global research universities, as you said. What we've been doing to solidify our gains are a couple of things. One is to become truly global. Uh, you'll, you'll be hearing about this also from my colleagues who are doing similar things. But we decided about a decade ago that becoming truly global would be a key part of our, our future. And that's meant a couple of things. One is being global here in Pittsburgh in terms of the composition of our student body and our faculty. But it has also meant going out into the world. And we now have campuses in Australia, in Qatar, and programs in many countries in Europe and in Asia. And we continue to expand. This is, I think, key not only because the world is so globally connected, but frankly, um, what has been a world dominated by American wealth and concentrations of wealth it's going to be a world where that distribution is much flatter than it has been. We want to be where the wealth creation is going on and be part of that. The second thing we're doing is to diversify our sources of income. One of those is by being global, but another is to um, do as much as we can to create ties to corporations, both those that are uh, global themselves and those which are here in Pittsburgh. And in a lot of cases, that's meant bringing them to Pittsburgh. One of our great successes in the last few years has been attracting companies like Intel, Apple, Google, and recently Disney to work with our uh, people that work in entertainment technology. So those are the things that we're doing. And I think universities, research universities to be successful have to do to continue to succeed. By the way, I, I would suggest to those of you who are visiting uh, uh, from elsewhere who, who, who want to see what I'm talking about, to, to go out to the Pitt and CMU campuses. The Pitt campus is right here. CMU is just right up Forbes and Fifth. Uh, they're, they're really remarkable. And, 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 and Chancellor Nordenberg, I wanted to ask you about Pitt. Both my parents were are, are alum, are alumni of, of University of Pittsburgh. If you haven't seen it, you've got to see the world's tallest Gothic spire, uh, which to me is a symbol of Pitt uh, and the beacon that it is to the people of the city. I guess my question for you, uh, Mr. Ch Mr. Chancellor, is how do you balance your commitment uh, to being a Pittsburgh institution? I mean, after all, it says University of Pittsburgh. How do you balance that with a, a world role, which I know you're playing increasingly, especially, I would say, in such fields as medical technology and so forth? Well, we never have felt that there was anything inconsistent between having a home region. Uh, as you say, we are the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, we always will draw our single largest group of students from this region. Uh, we always will place our single largest group of graduates in this region. Uh, but to have programs that are world-class in terms of their quality and impact. 
uh, in what we find today on the educational front in particular uh, is an increasing ability to keep the very best students from this region uh, here in this region for their undergraduate and graduate educations, uh, an ability to reach out to all corners of this country and beyond to pull in other students who uh, make the student body more diverse and uh, more interesting. Uh, and I think one of the things that is telling in all of our organizations uh, is the ability that exists today to reach out to recruit uh, faculty and physician talent. Uh, we recruit from the very best places in this country and beyond. Uh, and so, you know, Jonas Salk developed his vaccine here in Pittsburgh. Uh, but the development of that vaccine was a worldwide victory. Uh, we just don't see anything incompatible with those roles. Got it. Uh, Jeffrey Romoff, the uh, president and CEO of UPMC, let me ask you what may sound like a silly question, but could UPMC, could UPMC exist anywhere else but here? That's a silly question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. It's a very insightful question. I would proudly say that UPMC doesn't exist anywhere else but here, which is evidence enough. And I think one of the reasons for that, which I think is the follow-up that you want to hear about, is that Pittsburgh, historically in every sector, has been full of natural resources which beg to be mined and uh, beg to be put together, made into something better, um, uh, and thereby be used to the advantage of the region and ultimately to the advantage of the world. He, in the healthcare sector in Pittsburgh, we had as virtually uh, almost every major city in the country, we had a diffuse system a system of small community hospitals, a system of somewhat related university-related hospitals, but really weren't intimately tied to the universities and to research. We had just a bunch of things that were not put together in any coherent fashion. And to the credit of the leadership of this community, particularly the boards, of these hospitals, the boards ultimately of UPMC, the board of the University of Pittsburgh, we were able to voluntarily come together where parts, each one of these organizations gave up some of their autonomy to create something that had the breadth and depth and largeness of a UPMC, which is now uh, 50,000 employees, 8 billion dollars a year in expenditures, and increasingly a global health enterprise. It's a, it's a if I can say, it's a, it's a remarkable thing uh, because as I've watched it at a distance, uh, UPMC has grown up out of what began as the university-based culture at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, which was always very highly regarded as a medical center. I think. It, Cleveland, Minneapolis, New York, you know, LA. I mean, Pittsburgh was always in that ball game in terms of hospitals and healthcare. Uh, but it was through the imagination and the vision and I, and I guess the cooperation of people up here, among others, that they began to see there was a better way to do it and you could take the research from the university and apply it uh, more broadly and you could use business management practices to try to rationalize the care. Uh, this isn't exactly why we're here, uh, but right now back in Washington there's a huge debate going on about health care and how to rationally and humanely provide health care to all Americans. Those foreign journalists who are here uh, may be, be stunned to be reminded that in the United States everybody isn't guaranteed health care, at least directly. We're having a huge argument about that, and now that I think of it, these gentlemen here are part of the... Uh, part of the uh, answer, I think, to, to, our, uh, to our situation. Let me ask all, all of you, and anyone can answer who wants, 
Um, another thing that's always been strong in Pittsburgh has been, in the Pittsburgh area, has been elementary and secondary education. Because these systems rest atop what has always been in Pittsburgh, a really terrific local elementary and secondary education system. I'm curious how you view it right now in the city and the county. What strides are they making and what are you doing to help make sure that that, that base helps Pittsburgh thrive in the 21st century? Anybody want to well, take a maybe, crack at that? Uh, maybe if I can start on that because UPMC is exceptionally proud of our contribution, which was not a natural contribution, which my colleagues at CMU and Pitt can do far more uh, effectively. But UPMC made a $100 million commitment stimulated by the Pittsburgh uh, uh, Board of Education to basically assure that at the secondary school level that uh, students who are educated in the Pittsburgh school system can uh, receive scholarships that will allow them to go to any college or university or community college uh, in all of Pennsylvania. This, uh, and it became a matching program. We gave $10 million up front and uh, the other 90 million has to be matched about uh, one and a half times in order to, uh, to make it effective. But this has a profound effect because the school system in Pittsburgh, the inner city in Pittsburgh, has uh, progressively, as so many inner cities, um, converted to being the majority of, of the students a minority with the out-migration to the suburbs. So this became an impetus to support the school systems to have parents want to come and stay in the city and thereby re-contribute to the tax base. And for us, once again, to be able to be in a position to feed our spectacular universities and colleges with excellent people from the region who are committed family-wise to Pittsburgh. And as you know so well, once you're a Pittsburgher, you always love to come home. You know, all of us have been in our positions for a comparatively long period of time and uh, sustained uh, efforts probably have contributed to whatever successes we have enjoyed. Uh, Jeffrey and I have been here a bit longer than Jerry has been, uh, and I think each of us go back to the days when the quality of the Pittsburgh public schools was one of the big community assets. Uh, when you were attempting to recruit faculty members, for example, the existence of a public system of that quality was one of the things that could tip the balance in being successful in your effort or not. Uh, we are all working in our own ways to try to restore the quality of the Pittsburgh public schools overall to the days when Taylor Alderdice was recognized as one of the finest public high schools in the country. Uh, what the UPMC did by becoming the principal funder of the Pittsburgh Promise uh, really is incredible. I don't know of that kind of community investment in any other place. Uh, and as uh, Jeff indicated, really Jerry and I through our university programs are in a position to provide help of other types. Right. So we do have a Center for Urban Education in the University of Pittsburgh and are working hard not only with the Pittsburgh public schools but places like Wilkinsburg as well. Uh, and I know that Carnegie Mellon has special contributions that it's making of that type as well. Do you want to mention anything? Yeah, I would like to add one thing but let me also uh, second Mark's comment. UPMC's announcement of its commitment to the promise was absolutely stunning. Stunning in, in every way. And I think it was just an act of tremendous leadership, personal and institutional, by U UPMC and Jeff, and something for which we're all very grateful. Um, Univers University of Pittsburgh has real strengths that go directly to the educational challenges of the Pittsburgh public school system. In Carnegie Mellon's case, we do many, many things, um, many of them in the form of volunteerism by our students and faculty, and it has real impact. Uh, the other thing we do is to bring to bear our technology strength, and Carnegie Mellon has emerged as a real leader 
in technology-based education, uh, especially computer-based tutors for mathematics, which is having a very large impact around the country and increasing around the world, both at the middle school and high school level and now at the college level. Uh, and uh, I think very significantly, and something I, I hope we'll have a chance to come back to, a major thing we do, we do in collaboration with the University of Pittsburgh. Together, we won one of the first major grants by the National Science Foundation to create a so-called Science of Learning Center. Science, what's that? Science of Learning science Center. Science of Learning Center. And it brings together our strength in cognitive science and computer science with Pitt's great strength in uh, education research. And the collaboration is very powerful. The Pittsburgh public school system certainly benefits from that, but this has implications for education wherever it happens. Well, you, you have to take what I say with a grain of salt, because even though I'm a, a dyed-in-the-wool journalist, I'm also a Pittsburgher, so be cautious. Mm -hmm. uh, but the kind of collaboration that you're seeing, the kind of uh, commitment to the city, and by city I mean this region, uh, is, is, is not unusual in America, because America, believe it or not, is still a ground-up country from the ground up. Uh, but I've been in every state in the Union but one and reported from all of them and written about them, and there's no place, no city that I know of that maintains a sense of civic commitment greater than this city does. And it relates to the election of Barack Obama in this sense. Uh, Barack Obama was a Democrat from a big northern city, Chicago. And if you know a little American political history, you know how unusual that is. Uh, since Jack Kennedy, who arguably was from Boston, uh, the Democrats never elected since a president other than one from a small southern town. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, Jimmy Carter, and Bill Clinton. Barack Obama is a city guy. He's an urban guy. And in the 21st century, cities are where the action is. Uh, the big global cities. Does Pittsburgh have the size of London, uh, uh, Paris, New York, uh, Rio, Buenos Aires, uh, Shanghai, you know, et cetera, Tokyo, et cetera? No. Uh, but there's no place where pound for pound is the commitment to these kinds of cutting edge things greater, in my view, than here. And that's, that's, what, you're, that's what you're seeing. Uh, this is a, a really open-ended question. I want each of you to tell me or tell them, what's the most important thing about your institution that you're guessing they don't know, that they need to know? And I'll take it in reverse order. Uh, uh, Jeff, you go first. Uh, I'm not sure there's anything that they don't know about UPMC. Uh, but having said that, I think the most essential characteristic of UPMC which is particularly important today, particularly important today in Pittsburgh, particularly important given the adversarial climate with the recession, with health reform and the uncertainty. It's very important, but it's an uncertain situation for us, is our capacity to change and to morph and to be opportunistic uh, no matter how challenging the circumstances are. UPMC despite its largeness, uh, despite its, uh, the fact that it does or seeks to do so many things, has the capacity to mobilize itself with the faculty of the University of Pittsburgh Schools of the Health Sciences, with our staff, with our 20 hospitals, with our international programs, um, with our high-tech uh, relationships, with our collaboration with the CMU, and basically direct, sometimes in a laser-like way, what we want to do to be or seek to be in the right place at the right time. A very small example, well, it's not that small, but an appropriate example, is that right now the president is talking about uh, the need for digitalizing healthcare as one of the linchpins of health reform and making healthcare much more efficient and more cost effective. Uh, down the road a piece, uh, you will see uh, the new Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh of UPMC, 
which is a research center as well as a brand new children's hospital, which is 100% digitalized. And we started this about six or seven years, somewhat before it was fashionable to do that, and built on top of that, a bi or underneath it, a billion dollar investment in bringing all of UPMC up to being uh, at the cutting edge of, of uh, digitalization. We also did this in collaboration with our far more experienced and far more sophisticated colleagues over at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, President Nordenberg, uh, uh, Chancellor. Uh, let Sorry. me mm -hmm. say uh, in 2000, I think it was, uh, our board of trustees issued a public statement of aspiration. Uh, and said that we would clearly and convincingly demonstrate uh, that the University of Pittsburgh was one of the finest, most productive universities in the world. Uh, that has been our goal ever since. I think people who uh, are knowledgeable are surprised that we have made as much progress toward that goal in a compressed period of time as we have. Uh, people tend to view universities as institutions that are so large and unmanageable that to change direction even slightly or to pick up speed by a couple of miles uh, is an almost impossible task. Uh, I, I don't think that that is the uh, case at Pitt, whether you're looking at a near tripling of undergraduate applications, uh, a move from kind of top 15 to top five in terms of NIH funding. Uh, things are moving well on every front. But I do want to uh, use this opportunity to also say that we really don't think of ourselves as undetached, particularly from the institutions represented on either side of me. Uh, when you look at Jeff and Jerry and me, you probably would not find three guys who are more competitive. Uh, but we also are good collaborators, and we know that in this day and age, you really do need to define competition in a different way. Uh, it can't be the hospitals against the health science schools. Uh, it can't be Pitt looking enviously across Junction Hollow at uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, we really are in it together. Uh, I think someone once said, if you've seen one academic medical center, you've seen one academic medical center in terms of organization and structure. Uh, certainly that would be true of the relationship between UPMC and the university. There is nothing like it. Uh, and to return to one of your opening points, if I may, when Jerry came to town, we actually said, here these two universities sit side by side, one public, one private, one large, one mid-size, really complementary academic strengths. Uh, and we thought there was only one other place in the country, Cambridge, Massachusetts, where you could find the uh, total academic firepower that you could find in Oakland. Uh, and we knew that we needed to find uh, ways to cooperate and harness that power for our own good and for the good of the uh, community. Uh, and I think that is a part of the culture of Pittsburgh as you have described it. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I think the one thing that would come as the biggest surprise to um, especially international journalists about Carnegie Mellon is that we are as strong in the arts as we are in technology. Uh, we're probably best known for our strength in technology. But in fact, um, while we've won 13 Nobel Prizes, we've won many more Oscars, Tonys, and Emmys. Hmm. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful thing about this university. We're a relatively small one, as Mark said, but packed in the small package is this very different range of disciplines in which we're strong. That is of uh, interest and excitement in and of itself, but increasingly um, through our collaborative culture of working across disciplines, we're taking advantage of those twin strengths. So the Entertainment Technology Center, which many of you will tour later, is a great example of that, bringing together our School of Drama with our School of Computer Science. 
And the other thing I would mention is just picking up on Mark's point, and I can't, his last point, which I can't really add to, but it bear, bears repeating. Carnegie Mellon is, by nature, a very collaborative place. The notion of interdisciplinary collaboration has been with us for at least 60 years and is really core to our existence. It's how we've been as successful as we have been, despite being a relatively small university. But increasingly, that also means interinstitutional collaboration. And that means what these two institutions represented up here on the stage. That has been absolutely fundamental to our success in recent years. And I think the three of us working together has meant everything to Pittsburgh's success. And Howard, later in the day, mm -hmm. after a couple of drinks, Jerry will sing and dance to uh, <laughs> prove that art point for you. <laughs> No, sing and dance while I solve a complex mathematical yeah. problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, think you, I think you mentioned, uh, maybe you've just mentioned it here, I'm having a little hard time hearing because of the acoustics. Did, did you mention Disney again? Uh, not momentarily. Not well, 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 obviously, duh, you're thinking, what is the Disney company doing uh, at CMU? Well, they're putting together, there's Disney, see, it, now that I think of it, CMU, is Disney East in the sense that you put together the computer knowledge of Carnegie Mellon on one side of the campus with the arts, you know, CMU has a, has a fabulous theater arts program uh, and, and, and visual arts for that matter. Don't forget that uh, Andy Warhol, uh, the globally celebrated artist uh, whose museum is across the river and for those foreign journalists who are here, International journalists, not foreign. We don't use the word foreign anymore. The international journalists, go over to see the Warhol Museum. It's unbelievable. He was from Pittsburgh. He graduated in graphic arts from, from what was then Carnegie Tech. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, we used to say there were two kinds of people at, at Carnegie, what was then Carnegie Tech, and I'll demonstrate how old I am when I say this. Half the campus had slide rules on their belts and the other half were wearing serapes. And this is the 60s, and, and that, that continues to this day. It's, re, it's really remarkable. Uh, I have a theory, which I've never, I haven't mentioned to anybody, but I will, I will debut right here. Uh, there is a mythic figure uh, in the history of Pittsburgh. He didn't really exist. He's the Paul Bunyan of Pittsburgh. For those of you who don't know who Paul Bunyan was, he was a mythic man of the north, the great, the great logger and, and uh, 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 frontiersman. In Pittsburgh, we had a mythic steel worker. Uh, didn't really exist. His name was Joe Majorac. And uh, he ate ingots of steel for breakfast. And uh, we used to sing songs about Joe Majorac growing up in the Pittsburgh schools, if you can believe it. Well, Joe Majorac is gone, but I think among these three people, if you put together the robotics studies that they're doing at CMU, which is world class, and the bioengineering and healthcare stuff they're doing across the board at Pitt and UPMC, et cetera, that we could make here in Pittsburgh, we could create an actual biological digitally created Joe Majorac. Uh, and I think that should be a goal for all three of you. So how a collaborative effort, the three of you together. But anyway, do we have time? Are we about ready for some questions here? Could I, could I just yeah, follow up your very last comment? I mean, yeah. the, the, the visual connection is so powerful I can't resist. So I'm looking at Cardio Robotics, a company founded by uh, my faculty, and there's our professor Howie standing Right. Now standing up. There's your Joe Mazarek. So he's a roboticist. He works with um, medical people at Pitt. Yeah. And their company is creating a tiny, tiny little robot that's going to crawl around your heart. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm only half joking about this. I think this will be one of the homes of, yeah. uh, of bioengineering robotics uh, together. Yeah. I just wanted to add a point that uh, when, when uh, Jerry said uh, the, one of the great surprises to people would be the, uh, the success in the arts uh, at Carnegie Mellon, which is, of course, splendidly true. I think it relates to a larger issue about Pittsburgh versus other great cities. 
Uh, I grew up in the Bronx in New York, and I had all the arrogance of a New Yorker. And I was absolutely convinced that not only Andy Warhol, who lived downtown in a loft someplace, but all of jazz and all of arts were invented in New York. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was surprised, as I sometimes think many Pittsburghers are surprised, to find out that most of what at least I cherished as a New Yorker was indeed invented here in Pittsburgh. And, uh, and if, if we in Pittsburgh had a little bit more, I will go to the extreme of arrogance, but a little bit more of the pride and understanding of what we have here. And what we always have here, had here, not just what my colleagues and I hope to bring in the city of the future, I think we would at least enjoy it a little bit more. Yeah, I think that's true. And I, I, think, I think that to attract world-class talent to a city like Pittsburgh, uh, you need not only the educational institutions for children, you need not only the great universities and the great employers like we have represented here, you need a vibrant arts scene and a cultural scene. And you may be surprised, those of you who are from elsewhere, uh, to sample some of that around the city. Uh, great arts tradition, great music tradition, great theater tradition, uh, terrific public institutions and creative, and creative people in all communities. I mean, a lot of the jazz, a lot of, a lot of American jazz uh, I wouldn't say was invented, but perfected in Pittsburgh uh, on the Hill District, which is just a couple miles from here. Uh, a lot of great artists, not only Warhol, but uh, Mary Cassatt is one name uh, that comes to mind. A lot of great writers, uh, historians, poets. Uh, that's true of any American city, but I think Pittsburghers are very unassuming. And sometimes they're even, dare I say it, down on their town. Uh, since I don't live here anymore, uh, I've become something of a professional Pittsburgh town crier everywhere I go, uh, and I'm always proud to do it. And I might also say uh, that sports matters here, but it matters not just for the sports of it, uh, and not just for the community pride of it, but for the hard work of it. Uh, Pittsburgh is not a place, Pittsburgh is not a place that likes show-offs. Uh, Pittsburgh is not a place that likes people who are always tooting their own horn. Uh, Pittsburgh is very unlike New York in that respect. Um, and they appreciate hard work and teamwork, which a team like the Steelers or the Penguins in hockey and in the old days the Pirates uh, used, used to show. And to my way of thinking, uh, Mike Tomlin, who is the coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, is a perfect model uh, for quality and, and cutting edge leadership in the city. I believe he's sending his kids to the Pittsburgh public schools, if I'm not mistaken. He lives in the city, doesn't live in a big fancy house in the suburb. And my prized possession is a black and gold uh, t-shirt with the silhouette of Mike Tomlin on it that says, yes, we can. People do a double take when they see it. Uh, do we have time for a few questions? Okay, five minutes. Okay. Okay, let's see. Let me start with this one. Uh, what did Pittsburgh do better than Cleveland, Detroit, etc.? <laughs> Why has Pittsburgh succeeded so far? And this is from Adrienne from uh, the German media. Any of you want to take well, a Well, we have a that? Cleveland native here. The Cleveland, <laughs> the Cleveland refugee, here we go. <coughs> I thought we would get all the way through this without my <laughs> Cleveland roots coming uh, to the fore. I grew up in Cleveland, made the mistake of arriving here and the first thing saying, uh, you can take the boy out of Cleveland, but you can't take the Browns out of the boy. <laughs> it's the last time I said that publicly until now, and uh, international press, you won't beat me up. Um, actually, uh, the big distinguishing feature of Pittsburgh compared to Cleveland and Detroit is the Eds and Meds sector. Now, Detroit, for whatever reason, has never had a great research university, and maybe it's because University of Michigan is close enough that the city couldn't justify within the city itself. Cleveland, I know better, and 
they have no such excuse. They have Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Clinic. And I'll let others try to dissect this and you could pursue this further in Cleveland, but they've never figured out how to work together. Quite the opposite. They've really kind of been at loggerheads for many, many years. And they've, create, they've had many attempts to getting together and it just hasn't worked. And um, uh, I think that's all I, I should say about it. It's in stark contrast to what you find here of a private university working very comfortably with a, a public university and both of us working eagerly with and very productively with our major medical center. Anybody else Which, want to take a crack on that? Well, you know, I would say, because Jerry and I actually have talked about this, uh, and we have said that if you went back to the days now becoming more and more remote, uh, that we were college age ourselves, you wouldn't have seen that kind of difference between right. uh, Pittsburgh and Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland did have Case, and it had Western Reserve, and it had the Cleveland Clinic, and uh, Pittsburgh had uh, Carnegie Tech and the University of Pittsburgh, and a collection of hospitals that later became the UPMC. Uh, and so at some point along the way, uh, leadership was provided that first, I think propelled the individual institutions ahead of some of their competitors in other regions. Uh, and then the reaching out and the partnering began that made the uh, sum greater than the, or the whole greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, Jeff, you want to say anything? The only thing I would add is apropos, there's an article in today's Detroit Free Press. Uh, the only reason I read it is my colleague sent it to me because it's about Pittsburgh and about UPMC and about the G20. The sum and substance of the Detroit perspective on Pittsburgh is, would it be that we could have done what you did in Pittsburgh? And the Detroit Free Press, at least this author, this journalist's perspective was, uh, unlike Detroit, Pittsburgh was not a one-trick horse. And uh, it had the diversity. It had many, many things it was doing simultaneously when a very, very important one, the smokestack industries, fell away. The rest continued with the same kind of affinity for success and hard work. Sure. Do we have time for, to pursue this a little bit further? Sure, I think we with, have a few minutes. With, without uh, attempting to make any comparisons to other cities, but speaking as someone who didn't grow up here and has been here now for 12 plus years, I, I have to say that certainly one of the great uh, characteristics of Pittsburgh, which has allowed it to succeed, is the, the people, the, the, the quality of this place. And it touches on some of the points you were making, Howard. I'm continuously impressed by this. That, of course, there's the work ethic, which is well known, and the hard work, serious people, not not bothering to take the time to blow one's own horn, but just getting on, on with it. I, I, I wasn't here in the early 80s, but just the numbers themselves talk about an incredible social dislocation uh, when the number of jobs lost were lost in those 18 months or, or two years. For any community still to be around, let alone to be thriving the way this one is, 25 years later, I think speaks volumes about the quality, the nature, and the strength of the people in this community. It, it's quite remarkable, and I, I celebrate that as an outsider and wonder at it, and Carnegie Mellon, frankly, benefits from that and thinks of itself as an institution with similar characteristics, or and, hopes and, it is. And this makes a huge difference, a huge difference in ways that are not easily perceivable in the healthcare sector. Now, when you think of great health care, you want to think of great health care in New York, you want to think of great health care in Boston, in other major cities. But what you don't see is the infrastructure of health care, the nurses, the technicians, the people who do the housekeeping and the cleaning. Here in Pittsburgh, because the city is a manageable size, because it has a workforce, because you can actually get to work and live in a four bedroom home for $80,000 or $100,000 a year, you have a workforce every day 
that is competent, that is committed, that is ethical, and does its job. I don't care what you want to say about the flash of New York or the flash of a New York doctor. The hospitals can't work. The staff can't get to work. They can't afford to live near work. And then once they arrive, they're worrying about when they're going to get home. This is not the way you take care of other people if you have to be consumed with taking care of yourself. Here in Pittsburgh, we're comfortable with our families, we're comfortable in our environment, and we can give much more to each other and to the institutional commitments we have. Well, I guess it, po it poses the question about whether a city of this size, mm -hmm. and we're talking in the city itself of only about, what, 300,000 now, which is half of what it was when I was a child, in the metropolitan area of about 1.2 million, which is roughly the same size that it was 30, 40 years ago, can a city like that, which actually has some unique advantages in terms of health care, in terms of research, in terms of education, in terms of manageability, livability, affordability, can that city play on a global stage? It, can it be a global city of this size? Can there be a global city of this size? And I think Pittsburgh is making the argument, and I suppose we're making the argument here this morning to the world, uh, that it not only can be, uh, it is. And with that, I think uh, I'm going to thank these wonderful panelists, which, to whom you should give a round of applause, and thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.